Good morning po. I think we're almost all here and uh, we'll begin. Okay. Um, and we'll begin with a reading from scripture by way of um, starting our morning uh, recollection. And, um, and then we'll listen to a song. Okay. Or I hope it's not just listen to the song, um, but when we can, or as we are able to, we can also sing along, no? Um, and then, um, yeah, and then we'll proceed with our recollection, okay? So, uh, let's put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 3. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes through faith, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this uh, reading that I think is familiar to many of us, St. Paul talks about, he, he had it all. No? He had everything that could be counted as praiseworthy in the eyes of men. No? Uh, he had distinctions, titles, honors, achievements. He could even boast about being a persecutor of Christians. No? So he was that zealous for the law. But then having met Christ, he realized that everything was rubbish, as he says, rubbish. And so... Um, this past few days, we have been trying to meet Jesus, to meet mercy. And um, we want to also be like St. Paul, come to a point where we say everything else is rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay. So this song that um, we will uh, listen to together, and I hope we can sing, um, it's a song based on Philippians chapter 3, the, the reading that I read earlier. The composer is an English uh, uh, Christian composer, um, still alive, named Graham Kendrick. You may, have, you may know the song, uh, Shine, Jesus, Shine. It was very popular during uh, the World Youth Day in Manila uh, many years ago. So it's the same composer, and he composed this song. And uh, it's beautiful, no? so as we are able to, we can also sing along. So let's allow this song to touch us. Like I said, it's based on Philippians chapter 3, and uh, it can help us to also express to the Lord our desire to have Him.
Lord Jesus, we come again to you this morning. Lord, we want to be united to you in your death because then we are also united to your life that never ends. Thank you, Lord, for these days of the Triduum and our journey through um, Passover with you to life eternal. Thank you, Lord, for this time, these precious days of pondering on your scripture, of being inspired by women disciples, of knowing you as our treasure and our joy. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Once again, we entrust to you this morning that we might be men and women who love you, who draw near to you, and who receive great riches from you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 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 Good. All right, so another video. Okay. So third day, and uh, one last video. Uh, some of you have been telling me that you've been enjoying the videos. I think you'll also enjoy this one. Okay. Uh, it's another short video. Um. You know, one sub-theme of our uh, recollection these last few days uh, is the idea of generosity, no? the idea of generosity. Um, and uh, yesterday was a good example of generosity. And uh, today we will see another um, story of generosity. And so this next vi this video that we will be watching is about generosity. Um, and I... Yesterday we saw a an Indian boy, no, uh, uh, most likely a Hindu, but virtue knows no bounds, and the grace of God can be seen in in the lives of all people. No, um, today we will see a Thai man uh, and how grace also works in his life. Okay. So anyway, I won't say more, but uh, enjoy this next video.
ขาจะได้อะไรถ้าเขาทำแบบนี้ทุกวันเขาจะไม่ได้อะไรเลยไม่ได้รวยขึ้นไม่ได้ออกทีวีไม่มีใครรู้จักไม่ได้มีชื่อเสียงที่มากขึ้นเพราะสิ่งที่เขาได้คือได้แค่ความรู้สึกได้เห็นความสุขได้เข้าใจได้ความรักได้ในสิ่งที่เงินซื้อไม่ได้ได้โลกที่สวยงามกว่าเดิมในชีวิตคุณอะไรคือสิ่งที่คุณต้องการมากที่สุดไทยประกันชีวิตเชื่อในความดี <laughs> You're laughing at the <laughs> advertisement. Are there any Thai here? Any Thai uh, participants from Thailand? No. Okay. Good. Yeah, I've I've watched this many times uh, since I received. Somebody sent this to me, and I. You may have also seen it on Facebook, maybe no. But uh, I've seen it many times, and it it always brings tears to my eyes. Uh, and it's it's just. True that when we are loving towards others, that love is its own reward. No, it because it it comes back to us. It comes back to us. We are the ones who benefit most from sharing love with others. No? There are bits and pieces of this video that I I don't know if you notice. No, at the end the plant is alive, when in fact at the beginning it was practically dead. No. Um, And people shake their heads. They don't understand why is this guy so so foolish as to share food with a dog, or to give so much money to beggars. You don't know if it's a syndicate. You know, uh, they just say crazy guy. You know, again, it's like yesterday's um, story of people who don't understand why this woman would waste so much for so much money. You know. Uh, if if we are right, then it comes to about 183,000 pesos, just like that. It's gone. No, well, it's not gone. In fact, the scent fills the whole house. The fragrance lingers. No, um, and wherever the gospel is proclaimed, Jesus says, uh, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So no, nothing is wasted. Everything that we do for the Lord, the Lord receives, and nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. So we are continuing our journey towards Easter, and we want to meet mercy. We want to meet mercy. The passage today. Um, Is from Mark chapter five. Uh, let me read the passage. Jesus sat down 
opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow also came and put in two small coins worth a few cents. Calling his disciples to himself, Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury. For they have all contributed from their surplus wealth, but she, from her poverty, has contributed all she had, her whole livelihood. See? So we're going to um, look at 10 points again uh, to help us in our going deeper into this story and also to help us move forward in our retreat, in our reflection time later on, and indeed to move forward in our life of discipleship. No? So 10 points. And let me begin with some preliminary comments, okay? some initial comments. So Jesus is <laughs> people watching. That's how I like to think of this story, first of all. He is in the temple, and there are so many people around, and he's watching them. He's watching them. I like to think of the idea that Jesus likes to watch people. And he watches us okay, in all our daily things. From the moment we wake up, maybe in fact, even while we are sleeping, Jesus is watching us. And then uh, surely as we are awake and all throughout the day, even here in this room, Jesus is watching us. And he likes to watch people. No? He likes to watch people. So now what makes this story different from the Two earlier stories, well, we're still dealing here with a woman who is not named. She's anonymous, okay? another uh, outstanding anonymous woman in the Gospel of, Ma of Mark. But they never meet. This is the new thing. No? Or at least what's different about this story is that they never meet. So how can it be meeting mercy? Well, my answer is Jesus, who is mercy himself, he himself met mercy. He saw someone outstanding in her mercy. Mercy meets mercy. Okay. That's how I like to think of this story. And then this woman... She puts in two coins. Later on, we will find out how much exactly these two coins are worth. No? But already now, I can tell you this is an extravagant gift. We, we, we emphasized that word yesterday, no? e extravagant. In fact, I came up with two other synonyms for extravagant. One is profligate. <laughs> which we don't normally use in a positive way. No? Or prodigal. Again, we don't normally use that in a positive sense. But the meaning can be used positively. It's extravagant. It's extravagant. No? And what I want to say right now is that what she gave was extravagant. Okay? But as we will see, the value itself is very different. No? The actual monetary value is very different. Okay? Now, what is the context or the setting of this uh, story? Now, what I want to first of all tell, uh, mention here is where do we locate the story? Okay? We know that this is from Mark chapter 12. Okay? Let's look at the context. No? Where did Mark put this story? of the widow who gave um, who gave the two copper coins. No? 
what is the context? So earlier in chapter 11, okay, the, the, the earlier chapter, there's a very important story there about Jesus. They are, he's now walking towards Jerusalem, okay? Um, you know, he, uh, he, he, he's staying away from Jerusalem because of the authorities, but every day he would go to Jerusalem um, and among other things, he would cleanse the temple. No? So in Mark's gospel, the cleansing of the temple takes place in chapter 11. But there's a very curious detail in Mark's gospel. There is a fig tree, and Jesus was hungry. And he saw a fig tree with lots and lots of leaves. And so Jesus went there to look for figs, hoping to find ripe figs, because he was hungry. And there were none. The fig tree was barren. No? And curiously, Jesus cursed the fig tree. Okay? I think we, we were familiar with that story. He cursed the fig tree. And then they proceed on to the temple. And uh, Jesus uh, drives out the money changers and so on. He, he laments on how barren the worship in the temple is, you know, that all of these ex external trappings of worship, they are, they are for show, okay? And uh, the temple has become a marketplace and so on, no? Uh, and then the next day, they pass by the fig tree again, and this time the fig tree was withered to its roots, like this, completely dead, no? Just the, other, just the day before, it was full of leaves, but no fruit. And now it's cursed. And so it's dead. No? Again, it's a very curious detail. And un unless we are sensitive to the theological import, to the, the point of Mark, who is a profound theologian in his own right, then we will miss the point of this story. No? That Remember, on the first day of our um, recollection, I said there is a technique that Mark uses in his uh, gospel. It's called the sandwich technique. No? Uh, the first day, we have Jairus asking for Jesus' help. But right in between, you have the story of the woman with the hemorrhage. And then after that, you back to Jairus and the raising of Jairus' daughter. Scholars call it uh, inclusio, no? or the sandwich technique, where you have bookends, but then in the middle, you have this other story. Well, here we have another sandwich story, okay? And the bookends are the fig tree, and in the middle is the temple, which means that the two are related, okay? The two are related. How are they related? Because... The fig tree's lack of fruit symbolizes the barrenness of the temple. Okay. The two are very similar. Jesus was expecting fruit from the fig tree, and he found none. And he goes to the temple, and you would expect the temple to be bursting with real zeal for God and love for God and authentic worship. But in, instead, what Jesus finds is a barrenness as well, a lack of real fruitfulness. And so the two are related. No? Okay, now, <laughs> I'm not giving here a, a lecture on Mark's gospel. I'm just giving you the context, no? the context, because this is important. This is important, okay? Um, and then we go to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we have a, a few stories of opponents of Jesus, uh, people who try to trap him, people who try to test him. No? And then, uh, and as a result of that, this is important, Jesus then criticizes the scribes. No? He criticizes the scribes. Also in chapter 12, this is just before the story of the widow, the widow's might. The widow who uh, gave the two copper coins. Okay, I'm, I'm, bear with me. I'm, I'm showing you why this is important. 
So Jesus says, beware of the scribes who like to go around in long robes and accept greetings in the marketplaces, seats of honor in synagogues, and places of honor at banquets. They devour the houses of widows and, as a pretext, recite lengthy prayers. They will receive a very severe condemnation. So, for, from a literary style point of view, there is a con there's a continuity from this uh, criticism of the scribes to the next story about the poor widow. Okay, because the scribe is contrasted with the widow. Okay, the scribe is full of pretense, and in fact, the scribe preys on widows. You know? Um, the scribes, because of their religious flavor and their reputation, they are sought after by widows, and um, they, in a way, they take advantage of the widows financially, no? and so on. Uh, and so, here is a contrast that Jesus is showing. There is a point to why, at this point, Mark also brings in the story of the poor widow. It's a, it's a contrast to the, la, the, the behavior of the scribes. No? If you recall earlier, we saw that the, bar, the, the, fruitful, the fruitlessness, no? the lack of fruit of the fig tree, the barrenness of the fig tree is, is the same as the barrenness of the temple. They throw light on each other. It's like the, the fig tree becomes a symbol for the temple. And they're both barren of any fruit. Here, we have a contrast between uh, pretentious religiosity, you might say, with authentic spirituality. Here, we have those who prey on widows. Here, we have a widow herself who is very poor, and yet she gave everything that she had. So once again, we must see the, the genius, in a way, of Mark in, in, in his gospel. No? There is a progression of ideas that we see. And then where does the story take place? Obviously, it takes place in the temple. This is simply a, a, a reconstruction. Those of you who have been to the Holy Land today know that, um, uh, no, uh, I think the only standing wall is this one here. No, This might be the western wall here. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost sure this is the western wall, no, the wailing wall. No? But this is how the temple of Herod looked like uh, in the time of Jesus. It was a marvel. No? Remember, at some point in the Gospels, people were saying, look at the beautiful stones. No? Apparently, Herod brought in, he was a great builder. No? For all his uh, sins and terrible actions, he was a great builder. And so he brought in lavish stones and ornaments and decorations. And people were saying, wow, this is really, this is really beautiful. No? So the temple was a very beautiful structure. Okay. Here is the, the, the inner sanctum, so to speak. This is the Holy of Holies. Okay? Um, and notice that there are, there are inner chambers or inner courts. No? What, uh, what, 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 what's uh, referred to as courts. The court of Gentiles, the court of uh, Israel, the court of women, the court of priests, and so on. Um, so this is the temple. Yeah, I was referring to the court of women on the on the on the periphery, surrounded by gate by by iron grills, where uh, Gentiles may not go further in under pain of death. So this inner this 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 inner courtyard would be only for Jewish people, but then you have women who are allowed up to this point only, and then you have uh, Israel, the men who are allowed further in. And then you have priests who can go even further in. And then the holy place where only once a year the high priest can enter the most holy place, 
the Holy of Holies, only once a year. No? So um, anyway, this is where our uh, story is taking place. And uh, most likely it's happening here in the court of women. No? And uh, the men can, of course, also uh, have access here. And, uh, and in, 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 the, in the temple precincts, in the, in the temple area, you have about 13 of these trumpet-shaped boxes. No? And people drop in their money here. Um, and uh, they, are, they go for various uh, uses. Uh, in the temple or for charity and so on. So these are the treasury boxes that you uh, read about uh, in, this, um, in the Gospels and in this story. Okay, so that's just to give you an idea of where this story is taking place and what does it mean that people were dropping money into the treasury boxes. Okay, so more or less, this is how it looked like. Huh? And there are 13 of them scattered throughout the temple. Okay, let's continue with the story. Jesus is people watching. Okay, people, uh, Je Jesus is people watching. And he begins to notice, first of all, that many rich people put in large sums. Now, it's not difficult to miss them. In fact, it's impossible to miss this from taking place. No, you, you, because you can hear it. Um, the... People at that time didn't have paper money. It was all coins. No? And if you think of large sums of money, it's not stacks of paper money. It's a lot of coins. Okay? And when you put in large sums of money into the treasury, you're going to make a big racket. Uh, you know? And I think that that's what they wanted. You know? These rich people... They were calling attention to themselves. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's, you can't miss the fact that here are the rich people and, and, jana, and, jana, oh, and then they listen. And then ka, 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 it's, it's all that racket, you know, that loud, loud vo noise of them putting money into the treasury boxes. No? When I imagine this scene... Uh, you know, I even think of people clapping, <laughs> you know, cheering and, uh, oh, wow, yay, and so on. No? Uh, people cheering because, wow, so, so generous. These people are putting in large sums. Well, Jesus was not impressed, no? as we know. Jesus was not impressed because he knows that there are rich people who give because it doesn't really cost them much. Okay? It, they have so much leftover money that this is like small change for them. It doesn't make any kind of impact on their lifestyle. It's small change. In Tagalog, barya lang yan eh. Barya lang, no? Pang merienda lang naman. When I was growing up, we would say, Pang Yossi lang yan, Pang Yossi. No? <laughs> um, so you have rich people, and they can have so much money that even if they gave a large donation to the church, okay, people might say, Ooh, wow, people are impressed, no? And maybe that's what they live for. Maybe that's what they're after, no? Remember, Jesus at some point said, when you give alms, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. No? It's a very curious expression. But it simply means that when we do a good action, when we do good, like giving alms, let's not make a big fuss about it. Let's not be looking for adulation or applause. No? In fact, if you do, then, okay, that's your reward. You're after the admiration of people. You got it. So, <laughs> so that's it. No? Wouldn't it be better if you got the admiration of God? Because your father who sees in secret knows what you are doing in secret, Jesus says. No? So anyway, here is... Uh, Jesus, looking at all the rich people, and like I said, he's not impressed. 
Okay, he's not impressed. Other people might well be impressed, but not Jesus. And then he says, and then the story goes, a poor widow came. A poor widow came. And I want to call your attention to these two words because they're almost like a redundancy. You know what a redundancy is, no? It's like this word and this word, it, they're practically the same meaning. Well, it is almost like that. Why? Because widows in Israel were very often poor. Okay? Not all. There, there can be well-to-do widows, no? And so on. But normally, widows are poor. So to say a poor widow, it's like Mark saying, she's really poor, <laughs> okay? Make no doubt about it. She's really, really poor. Now, why do I say that widows are poor? Because the scriptures, um, the Bible is quite clear that widows are among those that God takes special care for, okay? God is the father of orphans or the fatherless. He is the protector of widows. In fact, there are three kinds of people that the Old Testament repeatedly says that God will defend, God will provide, God will look after. Who are they? The orphans, the widows, and the resident aliens. Okay? Resident aliens are non-Jews, but they live with the Jewish people, but they don't have all the rights of the Jewish people. They are aliens living with the Jewish people, but they are also often poor. Okay? So God especially is looking after the widows, the orphans, and the resident aliens. So widows in Israel are, are almost always poor. They do not inherit from their husbands. Okay? Under Jewish law, which sounds very strange to us, moderns or Filipinos, but um, when the husband dies, his property goes to the children, to the eldest son, okay? but not to the wife. If he has no children, it goes to his brothers. Okay, So it's, that's, that's the system. The wife does not inherit. She is at the mercy of her children or of her other male relatives. Okay? So that's why widows are among the poorest in Israel. Okay? And that's why the scriptures say God look, looks after the widows. So here we have a poor widow, which like I said is Mark's way of saying she's very, very poor. And we'll find out how poor. Okay, we'll find out in a moment how poor she really is. So, like I said, Jesus is people watching. No? Now, I like this particular artwork because here is a young widow. Now, I, maybe growing up, I have this prejudice that widows, I imagine to be old. <laughs> but that's not that's not always the case, correct? No, There can be, of course, very young widows. In fact, I have another uh, picture here. Ah, a young widow with a child. Now, why not? Okay? This makes her predicament even worse. This makes her situation even more serious. She's not simply old by herself, but she can be young and very poor, and even having children to, t to look after. Wow, that's, that's something new, okay? That's something new, okay? So why not? This can be easily the situation as well. So Jesus is again watching and noticing here is this poor widow, okay? Now, how much did she give? Let's explore that question. How much did she give? The New American Bible, from which I read earlier, says two small coins worth a few cents. This is a kind of a modern or a more contemporary way of saying uh, the, from the Greek. No? So two small coins okay, worth a few cents. Okay? And it gives us an idea of, yeah, a few cents. Okay? Yeah, it must be a small amount. All right. Um, the King James 
says two mites. This is where we get the pop, the the kind of the the, the proverbial widow's mite, no? The widow's coin. So that, that's from the King James version. Two two mites which make a farthing. <laughs> that's a very very uh, old English uh, currency, no? Which make a farthing. Okay. The Revised Standard Version says two copper coins. This is where we get the idea of the widow giving her two copper coins. And together, they make a penny. Okay? Now, um, let's look at the original Greek, shall we? In the Greek, literally, it's two lepta, which together make one quadrants. Okay? I'm, I'm going to explain. Okay? So in the Greek, it's two lepta, and they are worth one quadrants. Now, what's this all about? Okay? The lepta are the smallest Jewish coins in circulation. Okay? So that's good to know. We're not just talking about something that's very small in value, but in fact, it's the smallest coin. Okay? Uh, if you're trying to think of something that is of almost minimal value. Well, think of the smallest coin. Uh, that's the lepta no? in Jewish uh, coinage. Quadrants is the smallest Roman coin. Okay? Both are of practically insignificant value. No? But uh, for the... For the um, Bible students among you who, who like these kinds of details. So Mark first gives the Jewish coinage, and then he tells his readers, oh, but these are worth your quadrants. Okay, this is one indication that uh, perhaps Mark is writing, writing to a, uh, to a uh, Gentile audience who are used to Roman coinage. His readers might not be familiar with Jewish coins. So Mark has to tell them, oh, this is worth your quadrants. No? So quadrants is the smallest Roman coin. We're dealing here with pitifully small amount. Okay? But still, how much? Okay? How much? Yesterday, um, I, we, we did some um, arithmetic, you know, some calculation. And uh, the 300 days worth uh, of uh, uh, the, 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 yes, no, it's uh, 300 days wages, yes. Uh, it's 183,000 pesos, okay? Now, let's do the math here. The quadrants was about 1 64th of a denarius, okay? Denarius, as you know, is the daily wage, no? So, do the math, 610 pesos divided by 64 is about 10 pesos or more closer to 950, okay? So how much did she give? 950, okay? Can you buy a pandesal with 950? Yeah, like how many pieces? Two or three, depending on the size of the pandesal, no? And depending on where you buy it. No? <laughs> if you buy it in Rustans, it might be more, uh, <laughs> maybe half of a pandesal there. Um, but yeah, 950. All she gave was 950. No? So, okay, that's nice, <laughs> or that's good to know. Okay, but, but then remember that Jesus knows, noticed that. Jesus saw that, and he was just so amazed. He was so amazed. How, how amazed, so amazed that he gave extravagant praise. Okay? It elicited from Jesus such extravagant praise. Okay. This is the story of the woman who, uh, the anonymous woman who poured uh, her aromatic oil you know, on Jesus. And Jesus praises her action by saying, Amen, I say to you. I, I mentioned this yesterday. That when Jesus says this, it's like saying, Makinig kayo. Okay, listen now. Okay, truly, truly, I say to you. So it's a very solemn introduction 
to something very serious that he is about to say. So we saw this in the story of the woman who offered the alabaster, her, who broke her alabaster jar. Now, the same thing in today's story, when Jesus saw this widow putting in her small amount of money, again he says, Amen, I say to you. Okay? He calls his disciples, come over here. And then he says, Amen, I say to you. And it, it pricks up their ears. They know right away that, Oi, what happened? There's something very important here. There's something very serious happening here. And Jesus says, This poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury. Now, we are jaded readers. We've read this story so many times before that we kind of miss out on the reaction of the disciples. No? But if, if, if we were there for the first time hearing Jesus say that this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors, we would say, what? How could that be? Okay, How could that be? We hardly heard the coins that she dropped into the treasury. <laughs> you know, if all the other rich people, because they put in so much money, it made such a big clatter, big noise. People right away heard the noise of them putting in money, and everybody uh, was aware of it. Here, we didn't, even, <laughs> we didn't even notice, you know. It was just a quiet thing. She came. She did her thing, and then she left. Huh? Was she even there? No? Did anybody notice her? But Jesus noticed. See? Jesus sees everything. He likes watching people. He likes looking at us, even doing the smallest things we do. Even the quietest thing that we do. Even when we are quietly at prayer, in a small corner of the chapel, in a small corner of the, of, the, of the church, Jesus sees us. No? So Jesus says, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors. And the disciples were amazed. No? They could not understand. So Jesus had to explain, of course. He says, they all contributed from their surplus wealth. I said this earlier, you know, that there can be rich people who just give out of their extra. Okay? It's all coming from their extra, their surplus. Okay? And it doesn't really cost them much. It doesn't really cost them anything at all. You know? um, there, is no, there is no impact on their life. It's all extra. It's all small change. So all the other rich people, they gave from their surplus wealth. But she, from her poverty, see, see this? Jesus knows. Maybe he could tell from her clothes. Okay? Or maybe he had that inner perception to see into the heart of people, to know the lives of people. And he says, she who is very poor, very, very poor, she contributed all that she had, her whole livelihood. Okay? He could say this with absolute certainty because he's, he's Jesus. He knows. And he says that all the others gave from their extra, but she gave everything that she had to give. Ten pesos. <laughs> what is that? It's nothing. No? And yet, it's everything that she had. And she gave it all to God. She gave it all away. No? And that's why she earned the praise of Jesus. The New American Bible translates, she gave her whole livelihood this makes sense, of course, to us. She gave away her whole living, all that she had. No? But in fact, the, or the literal Greek is her whole life, bios in Greek. So 
hmm, there's something more at stake here. It's not just her whole living, her whole livelihood, all her wealth, all her possessions. No, she gave away her whole life. She gave her whole life. We are, in, we are witnesses to a, a, great, a great miracle of discipleship, a great, uh, a great example of heroic loving of God. No? Yesterday, um, the woman uh, with the alabaster jar, she gave a very, very expensive gift. And Jesus accepted that. So you see, it's not as if Jesus doesn't like, appreciate um, expensive gifts. No, He praised the woman with the alabaster jar for giving such a lavish gift. No, um, And it is lavish in terms of its value. Today, we see that for a small amount, but because it costs so much, she, she herself also earned the praise of Jesus. She did not only give a huge amount. If we are to take this literally, she gave her whole life. She gave her whole life. Let's, let's do a little bit more reflection on this curious detail. No? The woman had two lepta. And she gave both away. She gave, and they're very insignificant, like I said. No, if you wish, if you want, one lepta is only five pesos. Okay, and she had two of them, and she gave them both away. No, she gave both of them away. But let's let's do a little bit of reflection. Okay, what's the what can we draw from the idea that she had two, and she gave both away? Well, simply this, that she could have only given one. She had two, but she, and she was very poor. And she could have just said, I'll give away one. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay? But no, she gave everything away. If we are to take the, the Greek literally, she gave her whole life. So... <laughs> What could this possibly mean? She would go home and be hungry. She has no more money to buy pandesal, <laughs> if you will. No? She gave it all away. And I don't know, who knows? Maybe she would starve. No? But she had complete trust in the Lord. And we know that God cannot be outdone in generosity. That's a very important principle, by the way. God cannot be outdone in generosity. We think we are being generous with God, but God is much, much more generous with us. How much more generous? He gave us His only Son. He gave us Jesus. So uh, this woman could have given only one, but she gave both away. And that's why the gospel says she gave away her whole life. Okay? She entrusted her whole life to Jesus. Okay. Let me uh, give a few applications of this. No? A few more things for us to reflect on for our own life with the Lord. So one application we could say is it's not how much you give that matters for Jesus. It's not what you do either. Okay? Uh, some of us might think that, oh, you know, if I become a religious, that's more pleasing to Jesus. If I, like myself, I, I live as a consecrated person, wow, that, that would earn me more points uh, in terms of Jesus. Uh, no. No? Or, you know, I'm a, uh, you know, to be a missionary is a far more heroic thing than to be a father or a mother or a breadwinner or an employee. Employ no, no. It's not what you do either 
that earns you more points. It's not how much you give that matters. It's not what you do that matters. What does Mother Teresa say? It's how much love you put into your doing that matters to Jesus. So, and she's great with these wonderful lines. No? But where did she get this idea? It's from the story of the poor widow. It's not how much we give that earns us points. It's not how much we give that impresses Jesus. He's not impressed with the rich who put in large amounts of money. And here is this poor widow who gives 10 pesos. And he says, wow, she gave more than the rest. That's what matters to Jesus. How much love we put into our doing. Okay. So Mother Teresa herself would say, you know, you can, you can do the smallest act of love. Being faithful to your husband, being loving to your children, um, giving a piece of bread to a poor street child, um, being a good religious, yes. No? Anything that we do, provided that we do it with a lot of love, that is what matters to Jesus. Anything. Anything. It's revolutionary. No? Um, in the old ecclesiology, in the old way of thinking, um, the consecrated life was a higher life. To be a priest was a higher vocation than the vocation of married life. No. Common baptism, common worth. We have the same spirit in us. Jesus looks at us. The, this people watcher, <laughs> Jesus, this people watcher, and he looks at all of us with the same love. And he notices things that we do. And he reads our hearts. He knows what is in our heart. He knows how much love we put into our doing. That's what matters to Jesus. So th this would be very consoling. Um, a few of us here, uh, I'm, I'm also in a way like a religious. I live, uh, I, I have my own personal promises of uh, poverty. Um, and so <laughs> I cannot give large amounts of money even if I wanted to. Okay, But I can give my two copper coins. And if I give it with a lot of love, that is what matters to Jesus. Okay, So... This is one application for all of us. Okay. Another application is Jesus can turn the little we bring him into something more. Jesus can turn the little that we bring him into something more. We began our three-day recollection with the song, Something More. We were made for something more, no? which is God. But now... The idea here is that what do we have to offer to God? It's all so little. Whatever we can give to Jesus is all so little. Like the poor widow, what she gave was so little. And yet Jesus says, wow, that's a lot. And Jesus can turn that littleness into something more. Okay. Now, where do I get that idea Let's look at one story in uh, the Gospels that, has, that is found in all the Gospels. Okay? And what we're following here is the account of John in his Gospel. Okay? Because there's a detail there that is quite, um, quite striking. You know? So it's the same miracle, the miracle of the multiplication of bread and fish, you know? five pieces of bread, five loaves, and two fish, okay? Um, and we know the story, no? Uh, there's a huge multitude. Um, the Gospels say, how many people? About 5,000 men. And it's literally men, no? Which means that how many people were there? A lot more. In any religious event, do you find more men or women? Women. Do you find women without their children? Of course not. So you have also women and children. Okay? And so this event that counted, uh, I don't know why, <laughs> they only counted the men, and they said 5,000 men. In actuality, there would be more than 10,000, I think. 
women, uh, people there, no? A lot of people, a lot of people. We know the story, no? But the, the little detail that we find in John's gospel is that Jesus asked, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? No? Where can we buy enough food? So same predicament. Jesus does not want them to just go away to fend for themselves. He says, no, 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 let's, let's feed them. What? Feed them? No. So in this story, Philip says 200 days wages. Uh, so I did the, the math already. Okay, 122,000 pesos. That's how many people were there to, if you want to feed them. He said 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to even have a little bit. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and that makes sense. You know, so that makes sense. So it's a big problem. And then Andrew speaks up and says, hey, wait, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what good are these for so many? No? So uh, barley, by the way, is a very inferior grain. It's a poor man's grain. No? So it's cheap. No? It's a cheap bread. And two, oh, two fish. <laughs> and... 122,000 pesos would not be even enough for such a crowd. And so Andrew says, yeah, but what good are these for so many? And we know the, the story. Jesus performs this miracle of feeding so many people, which is a Eucharistic miracle, which is a symbol also for his own life. That he is bred for multitudes of people. Okay? There are levels of, of uh, you know, uh, marvelous application uh, that we can draw. But this is what I'm trying to point out here. Here is a little boy. And he has five barley loaves and two fish. What's he doing with two, five barley loaves and two fish? It doesn't say, you know. Maybe um, that's their baon, that's their uh, family meal, okay? But he seems to have presented himself. I mean, why would Andrew single out this boy with five barley loaves and two fish? Maybe the boy came forward with his own baon or maybe his own family baon. And Andrew says, thanks, boy. <laughs> thanks, but uh, that's not enough, no? But then Andrew reports that to Jesus, and Jesus says, come, come, take that, no? And so we know it, we know it. Jesus takes the little, it's so little, so few, and yet he can make so much more out of it. Does that apply to us? I think so. Because what do we have to offer to Jesus that is of great significance or of great, great value? No, nothing. Small, small. We offer him copper coins. We offer him tingi. <laughs> tingi lang. Bariya lang. Chipipay lang. Very, very small things. Our lives. Our lives. And yet, Jesus takes that. It's not small for him. It's not small for Jesus. He takes that and he makes something beautiful out of it. Something more out of it. Isn't that our life? I don't know. I know that in my case, um, I'm, I shared a little bit about my journey uh, with the Lord uh, to you yesterday and I said that um, when I was in college here in Ateneo. I had a conversion. I began to take Jesus seriously and so on. And so it's been quite a long time. It's been more than 40 years okay, uh, since then. And I would say that my life has been so enriched because of Jesus. No? What he only needed from me was my own five loaves and two fish. Small, small, small fry, <laughs> small fry. And yet he could do something wonderful out of it. That's my experience anyway. No? 
And maybe God could use my talents to multiply those talents. And that's true for all of us. Whether, again, like I said, you, you are a quiet housewife, you are a hardworking businessman, you are a very uh, faithful, religious, whatever thing we do, it's so small that we are able to offer to Jesus. So small. And yet, Jesus can take that. He does. He does not spurn the little that we offer. It's not like he only wants uh, an alabaster jar of pure nard that's very expensive, that's only fit for Jesus. No, he can take our five barley loaves and two fish. And he can make something wonderful out of it, something very fruitful out of it. Not like the fig tree that didn't bear fruit. No, we can bear much fruit because of Jesus, okay, because of Jesus. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the, my, my uh, ninth point, okay? We can offer him the little we have. We don't have to be ashamed. Let's give him the little that we have because he can make something much, much more out of it. And here's my last point. No? It might surprise you, but I'd like to also think that Jesus is the Father's two copper coins. I don't know if you were scandalized or struck or inspired by my point yesterday that Jesus is the prodigal son, the real prodigal son, in the sense that he gave all. He gave all for us. You know? He spent lavishly, recklessly, extravagantly for us, for our salvation. He's the true prodigal son. Well, I want to end our meditations by considering Jesus as the Father's two copper coins. And what do I mean by that? I mean that God looks at the world and he sees that the world is such a needy world, a dark world, you know? a world without mercy, a world without life, a world without truth, a world without any future, a world in sin. And he says, what, well, what can I do for this world? And God has two copper coins. He has two copper coins. Only one begotten son. Only one beloved son. And he looks at his two copper coins, his only begotten son, his beloved. And he says, will I give my son away? Will I give my son for the life of the world? And he does. The father drops his two copper coins into the box. He sends his beloved son to us. The father has no other son. And he did not send another prophet. They, all, they killed all the prophets. He didn't send an army of angels, what good would that do? He sent his only son, and he dropped his two copper coins into the treasury. And so the praise of Jesus can apply to God the Father as well. He gave everything that he had. The Father gave everything that he had, his only son. Later on in the letter to the Romans, St. Paul would say, if God gave his only son for us, will he not give us everything else besides? That's St. Paul in the letter to the Romans. Think of that logic, no? If God already gave away the most precious possession that he has, if God already gave his only beloved son, no other son, Will he, keep, will he keep back everything else? No. St. Paul says, think about it. He will give us everything else. If God already gave us his beloved son, surely he will give us everything else besides. Okay? That's from the letter to the Romans. So, I'm going to end with this 
very familiar passage. And I hope that this now means even much more for us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that everyone who believes in Him might not perish but might have eternal life. So my friends, we have been uh, together for the last uh, three days or until this morning. And the simple thing that we wanted to have is an encounter with Jesus that we ourselves would meet mercy. No? That we ourselves would meet mercy. We looked at how three anonymous women in Mark's gospel, how they encountered Jesus or how how they met mercy or how mercy met them, like I said. No? So we, we saw the woman with the hemorrhage. She spent all that she had on doctors. She met mercy and she was healed. No? The word for healed is the same word for saved, sozo in Greek. The same word could mean healed. It could also mean saved. She was saved when she met mercy. We saw the woman with uh, the alabaster jar. She lavished an extravagant gift on Jesus. She met mercy, and she was praised by mercy. And finally, this morning, we saw a widow who gave everything that she had. No? She gave all that she had, her, her whole life, her bios okay, in Greek. She gave her whole life to God. Mercy met mercy, and mercy, Jesus, praised this woman. So, extraordinary, we, we see that um, there are these three outstanding women disciples. I, I hope that you uh, enjoyed uh, thinking about their life, their example, how their lives can inspire us. No? Um, but more than just being inspired by these women, I really hope that we can all return to Jesus, no? that we can see that he is the prodigal father's prodigal son, and he is the prodigal father's two copper coins. Right? Amen. Good. So we'll end here, and here are again the questions, but it's printed in your um reflection sheet no um and uh, i hope you enjoyed our time together these last three days uh we'll end here um i don't know if uh father eric um yeah father eric said he wanted to uh say some final things to you before we end but i maybe he's not here yet yeah so, um, if I were to think of what Father Eric would say, what would Father Eric say if he were here? He would thank you for coming, okay? He would especially uh, thank those who have been very faithful over the years, coming every year to these uh, recollections. Um, he would thank the new people, uh, the students, the superiors who are here uh, these last few days, uh, lay people, uh, thank you for coming. Um, once again, you have the, the, the you have access to the grounds. Uh, it's hot, I know, no? and it's uh, not always uh, very uh, easy to pray in a hot place. That's why we have opened up some rooms in case that you want to stay in an air-conditioned room. No? Uh, but stay as long as you want here in uh, LST. Um, avail of our quiet um, venues, uh, our places of uh, prayer. Um, and uh, have a great Easter. Okay? So God bless all of you. <laughs> Maybe we'll end with a, a prayer, shall we? Let's all stand if we could. And... Uh, We'll, we'll pray together the, let's pray together the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and the Glory Be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, God bless you, and uh, happy Easter. <laughs>